Cool. Um, how's everyone going? You made it to the last session on the first day. Have you had a good first day? Yeah, awesome. Cool. Um, Tian said earlier on, I reckon it's like it hit five o'clock and everyone's like, I don't have to be in work. I don't have to be here. I'm off. So they just kind of went home. Um, who's going to the boat party as well later on? Yeah, okay. So you're just killing time before the boat party. There's still tickets if you do want to go to the boat party, I'm reliably told, so do come along. Cool, and um, we'll kick this off. So over the last 70 years or so, uh, researchers in social psychology and behavioral economics have identified over 200 cognitive biases that affect the way we think. And I've been working in software for about 20 years, and I've become strongly, strongly convinced that the kind of mistakes that I see teams making over and over again are caused by these cognitive biases. And I really think that there's a lot that we can learn from them, and I hope to share that with you today. So before I go on, um, there are my contact details down the bottom there, my email address, ianhughes at gmail.com, and ian underscore hughes on Twitter, DMs are open. So if you don't feel comfortable putting your hand up in a room half full of people um, to ask a question, please feel free to DM me or email me, and I'll answer your question there. So, uh, to explore the cognitive biases, 200 is far too much for me to even read out in the hour that we have together. So I want to use this. This is called the, the Cognitive Bias Codex. It was created by a person named Buster Benson, who is a marketing manager with Slack. And Buster took that full list of 200, deduplicated some of them, and grouped them into smaller subcategories and four larger categories that he called problems or conundrums. And all four of these somewhat limit our intelligence in some ways, um, but it's actually our brains trying to be helpful. They're like bugs in the system, bugs in our neural software. And according to Benson, every, for every cognitive bias, there is a reason. Um, it's primarily to save our brains time or energy. And Buster seems like, I've never met him, but he seems like a, a, a kind soul. Um, he says the end result of using these mental shortcuts uh, which is useful, also introduces errors into our thinking. But by becoming aware of how minds make decisions, we can be more mindful of the inherent inaccuracies and fallacies, and hopefully act, more, act with more fairness and grace. So I'd echo that sentiment, and it's kind of why I wanted to share this with all of you today, in that I hope in understanding this, you'll, you'll potentially kind of think a, a little bit nicer to some people when you run into these kind of situations or these errors in how we think. So, the first one that we're going to jump into is caused by when our brains effectively have kind of too much information. We're bombarded with information day to day. It's only getting worse as technology improves as well. Um, the first item there, we notice flaws in others a lot easier than we do in ourselves. I, I certainly notice flaws in others a lot more than myself. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that about yourself too, but it's, it's quite easy to pick apart what someone else does wrong try and do it to yourself, and it's like, no, I'm actually pretty good, you know? Um, we're drawn to details that confirm our beliefs. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, bizarre or funny things stick out in our memory more. So if I imagine you to, or if I ask you to imagine something completely ridiculous, like an elephant getting a jockey back off a penguin, that will stick in your brain. Probably more than anything else I'm gonna tell you throughout the whole talk, all right? Um, we notice things that are already primed in our memory as well. So if you've ever noticed that you've kind of learned something new and then over the next few days you see it repeatedly, it's not that it's just suddenly become more popular or there's suddenly kind of more of it out there. You've just become more aware of it. Your brain is switched on to its prime. And in the first area that we're going to dive into, um, we notice when things have changed. And sometimes we only notice when things have changed as well. So anchoring and adjustment is a common heuristic that we use to estimate things. When we're trying to, to pick a number from somewhere, we'll usually pick a starting point and then we'll adjust around that starting point. And that starting point is what we call that anchor. And the anchoring bias is when we erroneously stick a little bit too close to that anchor. Now to give you a real world example where this is used against you all the time, use car sales stickers. So the price that you see on a car when you go to a used car lot uh, is an anchor. And the salesperson understands the psychology behind this. And they know that it's very unlikely that you're going to move too far. You're probably not going to move too far above it unless you're, you know, just want to throw away money. 
but they know you're not going to move too far below it either, and they use that. So they can give you a slight discount while still you know, making a tidy profit, depending on what it is, um, but they are well, are well within there. So within software, where we see this more often than not is in estimation, everyone's favorite thing. Um, if someone says to you, if you're sitting around with your team and kind of asking, you know, how long do you think that this will take? And someone says, I think it will take two weeks. That two weeks then has become the anchor point for all negotiations from then on. If somebody else says, I think it will take three weeks, it's like, well, why do you think it will take more? And it's like, that's not really how it works, you know? But that's how these things happen within teams, you know? And even if you do try and de-bias it a little bit by using something like planning poker to take away that kind of initial anchor point, it's still actually pretty easy to do, even just with normal language. So if you're discussing a story, you might say, it's just a small change to the website, or it's only a new tiny feature that we're adding in. That immediately then anchors it automatically as a small story, a small thing that you're going to do. And people will get very, very used to each other and pick up on those cues from each other as well, where they'll be able to kind of see, hmm, well, I think that Dave is going to put that as a two-point story. So I'm going to put it as a two-point story. And that anchoring works and kind of holds us back in being able to do that. One quite successful, there's some people here that I work with, they'll probably might tell you otherwise, but one tactic that I've used to try and devise that further is to actually move away from what's called kind of expert-based estimation, or where you're asking people directly, to what's called model-based estimation. And Troy McGinnis, I'm sure you can see that over that side, uh, he's T underscore McGinnis on Twitter, um, founder of Focus Objective, has built a whole raft of tools that will help you to do this. Um, some people in my company think that I made these tools. I'm like, it's not me, it's this guy. And, um, yeah, but that's... That's using more kind of predictive models and probability theory to, to handle how you do estimations. So somewhat taking people out of the process to make it a little less biased towards what we kind of think it will be. And anchoring in its kind of original form when it was first kind of categorized as a cognitive bias only really referred to kind of numeric values, but it is also possible, or it is, or has since kind of been broadened since then to include more kind of our different concepts from numerics. Did I broke something there? Um, from numerical value. So in particular where people have a, a, like a, a view or an idea about a system, they become anchored within that view. And more, I see this most often in kind of people who are new to a team or new to a, a system, that they'll develop this mental model of how that system works. That might not be correct because they're so new to it, but they become anchored in that. So when they're asked to make a change to that system, they will make the change based on what they understand, not necessarily what they need to do for the entire system. So in terms of trying to mitigate that or be biased for that, helping those people by letting them pair up more experienced people until they get a full kind of mental model of the system that they're working with or understand the system more is one really, really effective way to help with that. So, so moving, moving on, on to confirmation, confirmation bias. bias. Who's heard of confirmation bias before? Yeah, cool. Um, it, it's, so the official definition is it's the tendency to pay undue attention to sources that confirm our existing beliefs while ignoring sources that challenge our beliefs. And it's kind of the reason why relatively well, hope, well seemingly somewhat intelligent people will read something like this and think, that is, that is good evidence that the world is flat. But they'll see something like this and say, no, lies made to trick us. The earth is flat. And this affects us in software too. It actually affects us, all of us, in everyday life completely. We always have a tendency to just take on the information that agrees with what we already think. And in software, where I've seen this kind of most often and where the, the, the kind of academic um, research has been focused in some way as well, uh, is in what's called a positive test bias. So have you ever written a unit test that was the absolute perfect happy path for your code? It passed and you're gone, tested, you're done, yeah? Um, what that's not hitting obviously is the, the parts that 
don't agree with kind of what your um, or how you, what you should be kind of testing with your programming. Um, and even during debugging, it can also affect how people identify what they think is wrong. I get a lot of kind of a requests for help from people within my team where they come to me with a very specific kind of error message or a very specific question about some obscure part of .NET. And the first thing I usually ask them is, how did you, how did you get to here first? Just tell me what the original problem was. Because they will become kind of so focused on what this little bit in here is that they think the problem is that everything that they will find from then on will just confirm that and they'll keep going with it. So they'll be down this rabbit hole where they don't actually know, they don't actually remember what the original problem was that they were trying to solve sometimes. They're just focused on this bit. Obviously that ties in with anchoring as well that we saw before. It's the same kind of neural machinery. Um, interestingly though, or maybe, maybe not, uh, experienced but inactive developers show less of a confirmation bias than active developers. So if you've been off the tools for a while and you're an engineering manager, you can use that as a bit of a one-up on your developers, feel free. Um, and like most confirmation biases, it's actually really, really hard to de-bias a person. Like the, the errors in our neural machinery, it's hard for the system to de or debug itself or de-bias itself. So it's often quite easier just to, to try and de-bias the process. So helping people understand, training them in, in kind of logical reasoning can help with debiasing for confirmation bias in particular. Um, hypothesis testing skills are also very, very useful. People can start to kind of take a step back from that and have a bit more of a methodical approach to it as opposed to trusting their faulty neural machinery. And in things like testing specifically where, you know, you're, you're kind of testing that happy path, Asking developers to actually seek evidence of problems as opposed to evidence that the system functions correctly. Just even reframing it a little bit can help with getting them to kind of think about it a bit differently. So rolling around again, um, availability bias is the tendency for easy to recall information to unduly influence your perceptions or judgments. And the research on this is, is really, really interesting. It's kind of, it's, Quite a lot of it was focused on how developers search for knowledge. Now, I know you're all thinking, but that's just Stack Overflow. But uh, it's not. You know, sometimes you've got like kind of documentation that comes from within the company or has been written on a particular kind of product. You don't have access to people to be able to do that. And what tends to happen is that they'll search that documentation in ways that they are previously kind of familiar with. So they'll actually access it through ways that they're previously familiar with as well. And it leads to a, a, like a really inefficient search. Often they're not able to find the information that they need because of it, because they're accessing it in a way that, that you know, a limited kind of set that they're just kind of familiar with. And they really struggle to find problems within that as well. It's also been associated with a preference for a particular programming language. So if you've ever asked someone at the start of a Greenfields project, you're like, go pick your language. What would you like to do? And they'll tell you whatever their favorite language is because it's what they're used to. It's because it's what they know. And again, the confirmation bias will kick in and they'll tell you that it's the best language for this job. I've looked at it and it's definitely what we need to do. But it can also manifest itself in, in kind of project-based organizations as well, where you see decisions based on information that is easy to recall. And it's particularly noticeable where you've had project failures. So where you've had a recent project failure will actually start to affect how the, the business, how the organization makes decisions around upcoming projects. They're kind of, they're particularly hurt by things, I get that. And what the research has found is that a lot of that is due to a lack of documentation on what the actual outcome was of previous projects. So one way to devise for that within organizations is to run retrospectives. So you don't have to run like a, a retro retro, but some sort of retrospective into what the outcome of a project was and ideally document that well and document it in a way that people can find it easily. Even the act of doing that though helps the organization to remember that better in that it may not have all been doom and gloom. There may have actually been kind of other things that came out of it as well. Within teams to try and de-bias for this availability, um, helping, well, asking them to make participatory decisions. So get the whole team to weigh in. Don't just let one person have you know, their most recent kind of understanding, 
bias their decision about what's coming forward. The diversity of the team as well can help with that. They'll have different understandings, they'll have different ideas about how to move forward. Checking you on to the, the next one. This is probably my favorite one, to be honest with you. Um, and it's one I think affects a lot of people in, in very different ways. Framing and fixation, probably the, the second part, is the tendency to focus disproportionately on one aspect of a situation, object or event, um, and particularly to, put, particularly to impose self-imagined barriers around that as well. And I want to give you a really extreme example of it. Um, this book was written on, it tells the story of United Airlines Flight 173, which was, um, sorry, a US flight obviously, uh, flying from Denver to Portland back in 1978, so quite a long time ago. On approach, they'd had a pretty kind of cruisy flight, everything had been perfect, but on approach at about 12 past five in the evening, they put their landing gear down, and part of the, the mechanism for the landing gear had rusted away, and it broke, and the landing gear dropped, so the kind of arm dropped. Now it locked into place, but the force of the drop actually severed the cable for the sensor that told the pilots that the landing gear was down. So they then had a problem that they had to deal with. If the landing gear is not down properly, you can't land. So they reported this to the, to the air traffic control at the airport, um, and then went into what's called a holding pattern. So they moved away from the airport and just started circling around while they tried to investigate the issue. Now the first thing the captain did following that was ask the flight engineer, that's the that's, if you're young, you might not know what that is. That's the third person. You'll see an old movie sitting in cockpits at the back. Um, ask the flight engineer to, to go out back down through the cabin and look out onto the wing. There's a tiny little bar that pops up when the landing gear is down. So that lets them know it's a backup system. The flight engineer went down and he thought he could see it, but couldn't be 100% sure. So they contacted their maintenance department. They spent about 30 minutes then kind of circling around. And in that time, the captain asked the, the head flight attendant to prepare the cabin for, for an emergency landing. So at around 5.47, about 35 minutes after that initial incident where the, the landing gear, the first officer turned to the flight engineer and asked, how much fuel do we have left? And the flight engineer said, we've got about 5,000 pounds. This is US weight. Um, but in Kind of avionics, 5,000 pounds is nothing. It's basically like your car, is, your car is hitting the red line. It's over into it. It's time to get on the ground. Now the captain was there, was in full earshot of this, but he was so focused on the landing gear problem and trying to fix the landing gear problem that he didn't take what was kind of a little bit of a subtle hint for that. And he was still discussing that problem and said, I think we'll be on the ground in about 15 minutes. Now the flight engineer immediately said, that's not enough fuel. The captain, oblivious to it, still focusing on the landing gear problem, asked the flight attendant, to, or sorry, the flight engineer to go back into the cabin and check if they were ready to land. So still just straight ahead. And neither the first officer nor the flight engineer spoke up after that. At that point too, they'd actually reached the end of one of their circuits that they were doing in a holding pattern where they should have really turned and gone to land at the airport. But instead, the captain kept going, turned back around through it. The flight engineer came back in. They were starting to get everything ready to land. They got about halfway back around through that pattern when the first engine rolled back, turned off, ran out of fuel. The captain asked, what the hell? And the flight engineer said, some, probably somewhat sarcastically, fuel. Um, yeah, and they rushed to try and do whatever they could. They tried to redistribute fuel across the different engines to keep things going, but they were literally run dry. So each of the engines rolled back. And at that point, they were in a complete panic. They was, there was no way they were going to make it to the airport. They initially kind of thought about potentially landing on the freeway, or, it was, or an interstate in the US. They didn't even have enough fuel to get to there. So what they did was they picked a, a dark patch that they could see and lined up to land on that. Now, fortunately, or maybe somewhat kind of unfortunately, that dark patch wasn't a field. It just so happened to be a group of houses that 
to have their lights off. So that's why it was dark. But they had to come into land. They didn't have a choice anymore. They barely missed an apartment block, crashed into the street, taking out a bunch of trees around that, crashed through two houses. The cockpit and first class cabin were disintegrated. The captain and first officer survived. The flight engineer, head flight attendant, and eight passengers died in the crash. The two houses were completely obliterated, but luckily there was no one in there. Now, I'm not telling you this story to scare the shit out of you about flying. Flying is incredibly safe. And it's kind of because of this that it's incredibly safe, okay? The, the crux of it is, is that a very, very highly trained person, a very, very experienced pilot, got so fixated on something that he forgot everything else around him. In the accident report, it used the sentence, they were so caught up in trying to solve the landing gear issue that they forgot to fly the plane. The kind of sentiment in the industry for the captain who was forced into retirement right after that um, and never flew again was that he hadn't done anything particularly wrong. It was just a bad situation. He still had to take the blame for it, of course, but people just felt sorry for him. Anyone could be in that situation. And I don't know about all of you, but I know that I've been in not that situation, but a similar situation where I've been so focused on something else that I've kind of forgotten what I'm doing. And I am one of those developers who has deleted a production database. Anyone else? Yes, I'm not alone. Um, and it is a problem. And it's not really just in these kind of you know, high pressure situations. It's not just when you're trying to fix an issue in production. Fixation and framing it's something that we do all the time. We become so engrossed in one thing that we forget about the wider kind of things that we're doing. We become so focused on delivering a feature, we might miss the fact that we don't even need the feature anymore. And the output from this, so after 1978, there'd been a lot of requests for this before, and, but there were, there were two real problems that kind of happened. The first was that fixation that problem within there. The second was how the captain had managed the crew after that. And the airline industry introduced what's called crew resource management, another CRM acronym that they use, uh, to help with this. And as part of that training, um, the first thing they do is teach the, the first and second officers about actually raising things with the captain and teaching them that the captain isn't always right. And that sometimes when the safety of the plane is in Jeopardy, you can actually take over. So you shouldn't be deferential to someone because of their, their rank within there. Um, they also introduced kind of even formulaic openers for that, which I think is a really kind of interesting idea. It's a, you know, a set of almost a script that you can run through as to how to do this with someone who is objectively kind of above you in, the, in, the, in rank. They also taught the captains about effectively kind of um, kind of delegating responsibility to people to ensure that there is always someone still flying the plane. And it has proven massive, mass, massively effective in the airline industry. There hasn't been an accident quite like this since then. And we've seen ongoing improvements throughout the, throughout the years as well. Um, just to reassure you even more that flying is great and safe, um, it is the safest way to travel. You do have more risk driving a car than you do on a plane. Um, Cool. So, uh, like I said, this is my favorite one, and I hi would highly, highly recommend that you investigate if you are going to look into this um, fixation on that framing in particular. Super, super interesting, and so much work has been done within there. But for now, um, I think we'll, we'll move on. So the second conundrum, the, down the lower corner there, is really comes from us not finding enough meaning in things. It's so kind of a little bit the opposite of the previous one. And we tend to find kind of stories and patterns in sparse data. We send tend to see patterns where they're not even there sometimes. We fill in characteristics from stereotypes and generalities. So we'll see one thing about something and we'll kind of make a whole story around everything else to do with it. We simplify probabilities and numbers. I'd go further and say we are terrible at probability and okay at numbers. Um, 
And we think we know what others are thinking all the time as well. We think we have a, a great insight into what people's, what's going on in people's brains. And the first one we're going to dive into, we imagine things and people we're familiar with or fond of as better. And conversely as well, we, we can imagine things we're not familiar with as worse too. So I'm sure you're not unfamiliar with this term. It is a cognitive bias recognized more widely as well, but not embedded here or not embedded here syndrome as we might call it, um, is where you have a, an, an aversion to something that hasn't been created by you. And I, I'm seeing this a little bit less when I started my career way back. It was, you know, nobody wanted to use kind of other people's software. Since open source has become kind of required, it's, or, you know, something that all of us use to build on, seeing it a little bit less, but I still hear the argument every now and again. And it, it's, it's a problem because it, it causes a, a bit of a tendency towards kind of reinventing the wheel. Like, I have seen people re-implement something that you could literally buy for dollars. And people still build their own CRMs, their own customer relation management software now, today, when you can literally buy it for a dollar per user. It's crazy. And it's kind of based on the belief that the in-house de developers or development can, or is inherently better suited to what you're building. I can see that point a bit and kind of say, yeah, maybe you might build something more purposeful, but if you can get a product that does 80% of it or 90% of it, does it really matter that much, that 10%? They kind of argue that it's more secure. Now, I've heard that from people who are building their own authentication. And I'm not, I'm not saying you, but in general, if somebody tells me they're building their own authentication, I'm like, please don't, please use someone else's. Um, if you think you're your development team are better than you know, Microsoft or Google or an Otzi or Okta. No, no. Um, they argue that it's, it's kind of more controlled, and yeah, I get that argument, but you know, you're taking on that control as well. That control is then something you have to manage and pay for for the ongoing lifetime of the product. Um, I've heard the arguments that, that it's, it's quicker to develop, and I'm like, it's, it's really not. It, it may like seem that you can build something a bit quicker, but if you spend 10 hours on something, depending on how much you pay your people, obviously, um, that could be the equivalent of a month's worth of an application that you can buy as a SaaS product. Um, and they argue that it, it can incur a lower overall cost. And that is the biggest amount of bullshit I've ever heard in my life. Because to factor that in, to factor everything in for an application that you're going to build, regardless of the size of it, you've got to take into account things like that. Cost of development versus kind of purchase the lifetime maintenance of it. Like, this is going to be a product that you have to support forever. Um, the support of it, how do you handle kind of security? Things are going to change. Things are going to update. How are you going to keep up with that? And then one that people often miss as well is um, what Troy McGinnis talks about a lot is cost of delay. So if I'm building a software system that takes me six weeks or six months to build it, I have to factor in the cost of delay of not having that system when I could have bought it six months before. And people don't really kind of factor that in. So that's a conversation I still do have a little bit, but. This next one is very hard for me to pronounce. It's extrinsic incentive. Got that, but there's a harder part coming up. So <laughs> what it means is that people attribute relatively more, ex more value to extrinsic incentives. Oh God, there we go. So that is monetary rewards. So if I offer you money, um, People ascribe more value to that than they do to what's called intrinsic incentives. That was a bit easier. Um, that's things like kind of learning a new skill. Uh, when they're kind of weighing the motives of other people. So it's a little bit like what we kind of talked about before about we kind of think we know what other people are thinking. But if you were to ask a person what they think someone else is more motivated by, they will tell you it's an extrinsic, so a monetary thing as opposed to an intrinsic, as opposed to a kind of a learning thing. And the initial study where, where, this, was, uh, where this was first kind of described, they asked a bunch of, of MBA students to rank the job motivations for a group of Citibank customer service representatives. So relatively kind of um, entry level job into, a, into an organization, doesn't require a degree. And these are the the, or this is the ranking of the motivations that they picked out. And I'm not going to go through each one, 
But I just want to point out, at the top, they had amount of pay. And at the bottom, they had, bottom three, they had developing skills and abilities, accomplishing something worthwhile, and learning new things. And that was the ranking that they gave for those customer service representatives. They then went and asked the customer service representatives what their motivations were and asked them to rank them. And on average, what they came out was this. So almost completely flipped around. The developing skills, accomplishing something worthwhile and learning new things were the top, which had previously been the bottom. At least the MBA's got the order right, just not the placement. Um, and amount of pay actually came in second from bottom. So it was a, the least, near the least importance to them for what they were, um, for what, or what would motivate them. I quite like the bottom one is that it's the amount of praise from your supervisor. So like a pat on the head, it's not, it doesn't actually motivate me that much. Um, but so this, this um, study was repeated multiple times across lots of different roles, lots of different kind of uh, people from different backgrounds, and it actually holds true. And it holds true from thousands of exit interviews as well. So we see these same things come up again and again and again. The things that actually motivate people aren't pay. They're not extrinsic, they're intrinsic. That's what gets people's are people kind of going, you know? Um, and in software development, um, I kind of, I see this more within, within software organizations or so IT departments, is that there's, there's this kind of view from leadership or management that it's kind of pay that motivates people, that it's, you know, your bonus or, or your salary. Um, it's really not. It's these first three. It's the intrinsic stuff. That's what gets, or that's what motivates developers to kind of come to work every day. They don't really give that, well, they don't really care too much about money because they know they can go get another job, a similar kind of salary elsewhere. And Dan Pink's Drive is an incredible book. If you haven't read it, um, I highly suggest you do. And he talks about this quite a lot, about um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose as being the, the kind of main motivator for people within there. Um, and one suggestion I would make, so if you are trying to infer others' motivations, don't try and do it from their point of view, just do it from yours, because that's really all you can kind of do, or really all you can kind of see into, all the insight that you have. So think about what your motivations are gonna be. Um, if you do need more of an answer, don't try and you know, do it for a group of people, ask a group of people, and ideally ask a representative group of what you're trying to infer, or a diverse group that you can infer a generality from. So, so we have, we to, have do to do a bit of an orientation change, change because of how the, the codex works. So if you get motion sick, maybe look away. Woo woo. Yeah. Um, so hindsight bias. Uh, hindsight is a tendency re re to regard an outcome of, as having been predictable all along, or at least more predictable than would have judged before knowing the outcome. And we would have judged before knowing the outcome. Um, where do you think this kind of comes up a lot in IT? Yeah, it's yeah, project, project failures is, is all the time. Um, and it's, you know, even in quite kind of mature teams, you'll still see it, that they have this idea that we could have predicted the outcome from, from way back. That we should have seen that it was gonna fail from the very start. And that's, you know, that, well then why did we do it? It was, you know, if we knew it wasn't going to work. Um, and again, similar to, to what we talked about before, it's actually the, the, the absence of kind of records of what happened in these things, that that is the problem. That we're feeding back in for, from our memories as opposed to something that was actually written down at the time. Something we do within Telstra Purple, where I work, um, still getting used to the new name, is we run a pretty comprehensive, what we call a kickoff. So where we document down the, the recorded vision, the objectives that we had, and any risks that we foresaw. This here is just kind of explaining the, or the diagram here just explains the process that we're going through. We're trying to get people all onto the same page. So they're all imagining different things and we want them to all have a good understanding of what the one thing is that we're gonna do. This document then becomes a record for us that at the end of the project, if things do go wrong, we can look back at that. And we can say, oh yeah, okay, it was a risk. We saw it, maybe we didn't you know, account for that risk properly, but we can trace it back. But it's records like this and kind of documentation like this, and it's not laborious, it's 20 pages, sparsely kind of filled in. Um, it takes about half an hour to, to fill one in. Um, but once you have this, you're able to look back on that, and it can help you with that kind of hindsight bias. 
And somewhat related to kind of hindsight bias that is, is quite interesting uh, is a thing called black swan theory. Has anyone heard of black swan theory? A few? Cool. Um, so uh, black swan theory, is, it's kind of like a, a, a metaphor that describes uh, an, an event outcome as a surprise. And it's a surprise that has like a, a major effect or a world changing effect. And it's, it's often inappropriately kind of rationalized after the fact as something that was kind of predictable. And the phrase uh, black swan is actually really, really old and originates from, from Europe. Um, there, it was originally in Latin somewhere, so it's really old. And it originally meant something that was impossible because Europeans had only ever seen white swans. So black swan was a complete impossibility. And then in 1697, a Dutch explorer by the name of Willem de Vlaming uh, sailed into what is modern day Perth on the Swan River and saw one of these. And the phrase changed, and it came to take on that, that connotation of something, a perceived impossibility that might late, later be discovered. And we've seen a few of these in software, in our industry, in fact. In fact, a lot of us are probably working in the industry because of it. If you think of the advent of the web, it was a black swan event. Nobody really saw what was going to happen with it. Nobody really knew how it was going to affect things. I don't think anyone could have ever like predicted that social media would cause the downfall of democracy. But, you know, <laughs> here we are. So, yeah, and Google in itself. Google is another one that I, I'd like to talk about. I remember when Google started, I'm that old. And nobody knew that search was going to change everything, that it was going to change how the entire web worked. And I know it wasn't really search, it was advertising through search, but nobody saw that in Google, especially not Yahoo, who had the option to buy them a long time before as well. But the point of this that I want to get at is that sometimes shit just happens. Sometimes the world just changes and you can't predict it. And you certainly can't look back and go, we should have seen that coming and reacted to it. Alrighty, so on to our third conundrum. And this one comes from our need to act fast. So these are like the kind of where our brain tries to shortcut things or where we have to make decisions quickly. These are some of the problems that kind of fall out from that. And the first one there, we, we kind of favor simple looking complete options over complex, ambiguous options. We try and avoid mistakes by aiming to preserve kind of autonomy and group status and not making irreversible decisions. So we'll, we don't want to make something that can't be kind of undone because we don't want to lose our status with the group. Um, to get things done, we, we tend to complete things that we've already invested time and energy in. Or not, if you're a procrastinator. Um, to stay focused, we kind of fav favor kind of immediate relatable things that are in front of us, as opposed to things that aren't in front of us. And the first one we're going to jump into to, to act, we must be kind of confident that we can make an impact and feel what we do is important. So, overconfidence. I'm going to do it again. I am an overconfident developer at times. Is anyone else an overconfident developer? Some people. The rest of you are liars. Um, <laughs> Um, and there's, there's, out of all of the ones that we're kind of covering today, this is the one that's had the most academic research into it. Um, there's been about, I think, 117 papers. Someone did a meta study recently on it, and there were 117 papers. I think something crazy like 70 or 80 of them were about overconfidence. Uh, so that, that kind of says something about our industry, I think, in a bit, or that people are kind of willing to invest so much into it. And it actually comes from, like a lot of it is actually from estimation. So there, there's a perceived kind of overconfidence in how we do estimation. And you can argue there's kind of different factors within that as well. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so some, some of the insights from those papers uh, is that, again, might be a little bit surprising. Technical roles appear somewhat more overconfident than non-technical roles when it comes to estimating some particular kind of software development task within there. So it turns out that actually having knowledge, an in-depth knowledge of something doesn't necessarily make you better at estimating for it. Kind of conf or confirmation bias and anchoring bias, they'll really kind of hook into that too as well. But in particular, one study um, suggests that an overconfidence can lead people into to misunderstanding the kind of requirements in the first place. So they think that they kind of understand what's needed to be built much, much better than they actually do. And they end up kind of, well, mucking things up completely. Um, 
My favorite line from it all, though, is that project managers often are often overconfident in time and resource estimation, and this can lead to outright project failure. Um, I did this talk in Oslo, in, in Norway, and I had a, a person come up to me at the end in a very like, kind of dry Scandinavian accent that I'm a project manager. And I was like, oh, shit. And he's like, no, no, you're right. Um, so he said, I, I had a project um, where we'd actually done our projections on about 90% productivity, but if I'd actually dropped that to about 70, it would have been right. And I'm like, no, it was still wrong, but never mind. Um, averages are a terrible kind of thing to use, you know? You shouldn't be using averages for, for estimating things like that. Um, but what happened was they kind of, they'd started, they'd had a few like really kind of short, quick kind of tasks that they'd done, and he'd gone, yep, we're at 90% productivity, let's factor that all the way through. When it dropped down to about to that 70, they never like kind of recalculated. They just kind of said, oh no, we'll make it up. We'll get back to it. Now, if you've dropped from 90 to 70, you know, for a while, how much do you, how much does your productivity need to go up to be able to get back to 90% again? It's actually more than 100 from the timeline that kind of he gave me. But the, you know, this is the this is the problem that they didn't even do that. They didn't even kind of factor into what it would be. Um, if you want to know more about why averages are bad or terrible, I'd highly recommend the book The Flaw of Averages. The, the joke here, which you probably can't see, is that the average depth of this pond is three feet. So, but you fall down the big hole. <laughs> so to, to be biased for this, um, I recommend using kind of directed questions. So where you're trying to get estimates or, or get people to kind of, uh, yeah, sorry, to give you estimates. Um, Attempting to kind of elicit more information through kind of um, questioning, like ask them to kind of play devil's advocate for what they're kind of proposing. Get them to think about it a little bit different way. So ideally, they kind of come out with a different answer that will kind of challenge what they're what they're thinking. Um, and in, encouraging teams to engage in kind of self-reflective learning as well. So where you've had a problem with a, or you're trying to estimate something, um, ask them to kind of reflect back on that and reflect back on their kind of original assumptions and what they were and help them to figure out better ways of, of dealing with that in the future and going forward. And um, this, just, this doesn't just apply to that kind of, you know, where you're doing uh, planning poker or anything like that. It's across the board. It's good to get people to think about these things and how they're breaking these things down. Um, and particularly that kind of framing estimation questions in a little bit of a different way. So rather than asking kind of um, how much can be completed in a certain amount of hours by kind of turning it around and saying kind of, or sorry, rather than asking kind of how much effort will something take, you kind of turn it around a bit and say how much can, can be completed in why work hours. That actually works better because people will kind of fill up a bucket with the work as opposed to trying to guess how big of a bucket you need for the work. Do you know what I mean? Cool. Uh, this one's a surprise for me. Who's heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, the, the official description is that it's a, a mistake, or people mistakenly assess cognitive ability as greater than it is. Um, it's kind of related to a thing called illusory superiority, which is a bit further up in there. Um, and it, it kind of comes from the ability of people to, to recognize their lack of ability. In, in the media, it's kind of commonly portrayed as this. It's kind of like people who are new to a thing are dumb. That's the, the kind of message of it. It's not actually what it is. Um, what, what the original kind of study found was that um, students of a, of a kind of a lower ability actually rated themselves a bit higher, but students of a higher ability actually related themselves or um, rated themselves a bit lower as well. So they kind of met in the middle. So there was kind of two parts to it. Um, and the, f the first part was that the more kind of competent students uh, they tended to, to underestimate their own competence, but it was because they assumed that tasks that were easy for them were easy for everyone else as well. Whereas the, the kind of, uh, the students who were, who were incompetent just kind of didn't really know what they didn't know. So it is a bit, bit like that, you know, but that was kind of only half of it. And that illusory superiority kind of, it results from an internal illusion of people with low ability. So they kind of, they have a, an external misrepresentation of what kind of high ability is. So they don't know, they can't see why the high achievers are high achievers, and they can't really kind of put themselves in the right spot because of that. Um, and 
little quote from one of the studies was, if you're incompetent, you can't know you're incompetent because the skills you need to produce a right answer are exactly the skills you need to recognize what the right answer is. And that's quite a, quite a succinct um, description of it. And interestingly, uh, as opposed to high performers, kind of those, those lower performers, they actually didn't learn too well from feedback uh, suggesting that they need to improve. What they actually found was that you, you need to specifically tell them the areas that they need to improve in in order for them to be able to do it. So you need to correct, correct that kind of that, um, that misunderstanding that they have about what it is or the lack of understanding they have about what it is. So simply telling them you're, not, you're just not good enough, you need to do better, doesn't work. You have to specifically tell them you need to work in these particular areas within there. Um, then they will start to gain that, thought, gain that kind of experience and understanding and hopefully kind of move back up. Um, the reason why, why I kind of raise this one up is in, in software, it's not something I see a lot of, but it's a very kind of insidious one because most of us are, well, I'm gonna say all of us, we're all super intelligent people. Um, and we kind of think that we understand a lot about everything. And we kind of think that we understand everything. And when we're working with people from different backgrounds, so if you're a developer, you might be working with someone from UX. I work with a lot of salespeople. Um, and what I found is that smart people will kind of think that they understand these areas a lot more than they do. And they're almost kind of on this Dunning-Kruger effect. They're falling kind of prey to that because they don't understand those areas. Um, a good example I like to use is, if you ever had a, a designer or UX or graphic or any, anything like that show something to you and all of a sudden developers will become experts in fonts. Like, absolute expert. I don't know what's that font. Like, that's not your job, Joe. <laughs> and I see the same thing happening in, in kind of other areas too, um, where people just assume that because I understand a little bit about this, I actually have a lot of knowledge in it. So maybe just a bit of humility is kind of warranted when we're interacting with other, other kind of uh, fields. Um, interestingly, on average, um, men are affected more by this than women. So men tend to, to overestimate their abilities about 30% and women by about 15%. So it's not, um, not a huge difference, but interesting one. There's also socioeconomic effects as well. Um, those from a, a high socioeconomic class are more likely to, to overestimate their abilities. And there's cultural forces as well. So depending on where you were born, the kind of uh, society you were brought, in, brought up in, um, it will affect you too. For me, the, the kind of the de bias for this is diversity in things. When you have a lot of people who are in the same situation, who've had a lot of the same kind of experiences, they're more likely to fall prey to this as a group than they, are, than they would be if they were more diverse. Where you've got people from different backgrounds who've done different things, this doesn't come into effect quite as much. Um, on to the next one, so appeal to novelty. Um, so the, the appeal to novelty is, it's what's called fallacy, a, a kind of a type of cognitive bias. And it's where someone prematurely claims that an idea is correct or superior purely because it's brand new. So um, it may take kind of two forms. One of them is that it's kind of overestimating the new, new and shiny thing. The other side is that it's kind of underestimating what was already there. So it's underestimating the status quo. And it may prove true. So the new and shiny may actually be a better thing, but the fallacy itself is within just assuming that it is purely because it's new, new and shiny. So to give you an example from development, JavaScript frameworks, yeah, yeah. Um, React is losing its edge now. So we've got Vue talks at the conference this year. That's Vue is the new thing. Everyone better jump over. Um, but yeah, to give you like a, a bit more of an extreme example, the, the dot-com bubble from the early 2000s, which some of you are old enough to remember, uh, was an absolute pure appeal to novelty. It was crazy. If you've seen, um, has anyone watched Valley of the Boom on HBO? It was on, it was on my flight to Oslo, I watched the whole thing. It was great. Um, talked about all that. It was specifically the story of Netscape, and it was pure madness. People were throwing money that, at anything that was a dot-com or a website. It was so crazy that one company put .com on the end of their name. They didn't even have a website, but their stock price went up. It was just a completely nuts time. Um, but even within my teams, I've had kind of a, a bit of an experience of this. I had a, one of my colleagues came to me last year. 
he just rolled off a couple of Xamarin projects. If you don't know what Xamarin is, it's like a mobile development framework from Microsoft. Um, hated Xamarin, didn't really enjoy it too much. But he wanted to, to do the next project that he was rolling on to in React Native. And I said to him, have you had a look into it? And he said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, he's like, yeah, I tried, to, tried out a couple of things. And I'm like, that means he's read a blog post on it. Um, and I'm like, well, listen, you know, whatever you think, but I'd have a, a kind of a good look into it. And he went away and worked on that project for about six months. And by the end of that six months, they did release something, they got it out, but now he hates React Native too. So it's interesting to see, you know? Um, so like, you know, just doing a bit of investigation into these new things, trying to find out what the pain points are, talk to people who've done it as well. Um, places like this are a good place to do that. Before you kind of just jump into an appeal to novelty like that. Now, there can be situations where kind of a, an appeal to novelty is justified. Um, had another project where we were working with a, a company who had a 30-year-old VB6 application. Um, yeah. And they'd, they'd actually lost two whole teams within a year. So two entire teams had been hired and left of their own accord because they didn't want to do VB6. And in that case, an appeal to novelty is very much warranted where you've got basically what's kind of a, you know, a continuous decay of something where it's, it's dying and you just have to replace it. So, yeah, in some cases it can be warranted. Alrighty, jumping up a little bit, uh, some, some cost fallacy. So for, wow, I'm really over time. Um, is where we have a tendency to rationally invest more resources in a situation um, than is warranted. So as compared to like a similar situation where a prior investment hasn't been made. I like to think of this like, you know when you buy a concert ticket and then you kind of don't want to go anymore, but you still kind of go because you bought the ticket and you kind of go along and you like, hate it. And you're like, yeah, it wasn't so good. Um, one interesting one of this that we've seen in industry, I kind of was, was searching for a particular one. Um, I found a very interesting one that I hadn't seen before, but you may have heard of it. So let's say you're like a state government in, let's say Queensland, back in the kind of early 2000s, and you want to replace your payroll system. Yeah, it's your payroll system that took you about six years to roll out previously, um, but you're trying to like kind of amalgamate everything into one. You get a quote from a company. They tell you that they can build you a new system for about $6 million in, in about eight months. You really need it within eight months because your, your old system is going out of support. At the end of about two years, not eight months, two years, you kind of, you've got to, it's 2008, still no system. How much more would you be willing to pay to get your system? Having originally, you've already paid the six million. Did you do another six? Queensland did another 100 for two years. And then in 2010, they released the payroll system against the wishes of the developer who built it for them and against the wishes of the vendor who was supplying the kind of base system. At that stage, they paid an estimated somewhere around kind of 150 million from an initial six million cost. They didn't test it. Yeah, they rolled it out without testing and it was a complete shit show, um, an absolute mess. In, since then, um, and these are kind of estimated costs, we still don't really know what the true cost of it was, but from then, all the way through to about 2008, last year they, they decided they were gonna get rid of it. Um, it's cost them about 1.2 billion in total. So they went from a six million initial start to 1.2 billion. To put that in perspective, six million seconds is about 70 days. 1.2 billion seconds is about 38 years. So that's how much more they paid from it. And at no point in that, well, I'm sure there was some dissenters and some people kind of questioned things, but most, there was nobody said, let's just stop. Let's just not do it anymore. So I'm sure you've all been in projects like that where someone hasn't really just taken the, the kind of the decision that it's just not worth it anymore. And the fallacy in that is where you actually make that decision, where you kind of go, we're gonna continue because we've already invested a lot in it. That's the fallacy itself. The actual kind of ongoing thing is about what's called a, an escalation of commitment, where you decide just to keep going and keep going within there. And that escalation of commitment is explained in kind of three elements. There has to be that initial kind of um, situation, the cost or time that's been invested into it. The, the past has led to a point the second kind of uh, element is it's led to the point where you now kind of have to make that decision within there. And the third point is that, um, you know, somebody has to make the decision as to whether to keep going or to stop. 
And more often than not, the main thing that motivates those people in that point is whether or not they think other people will agree with them. So when a leader's making that decision, they're thinking about what other people will think. Now, from everything else I've told you, how do you think that goes, you know? Not very good, but this is the way we can kind of deal with this sort of thing, is one, people, other people can speak up. So if you can tell your leader that this is a bad idea, we should stop it, that will help them to make that decision because they are relying on what other people think to help make their decision. Um, giving that decision to a wider group, rather than putting it on one person to try and figure out what that is, give it to a wider group of people to be able to do. Um, even ultimately, just give the team who are building that thing their own power to cut it themselves. If they feel like they're not delivering on it or can't deliver on it, they can cancel it. Chucking on quickly. Um, so, into the last section, the last conundrum, and open up a can of worms on this one just before we wrap up. Um, it comes from how our brains figure out what we should remember. Um, our memories are terrible. Like, they're shocking, shockingly bad. We store memories differently based on how we experience them. So you know when you're in a situation where someone thinks something and, or someone remembers something and you remember it a little bit differently, and you're like, well, you know, they're remembering it wrong? It's not that they're wrong, you're both wrong, and something else completely different happened. It's not, there's no truth in the middle. Um, it's completely affected by what, how, where you were at the time. Um, we reduce events and lists to their key elements. So we're very bad at remembering lists of items. Can anyone remember the first cognitive bias I talked about? Gee, see? Yeah, we're terrible at it. Um, even, recall, even, even recalling, I think someone got it there. Even recalling, and re even recalling a memory actually changes it. So when we remember something, we add new bits into it as well. We change what it looked like, or what we remember it as. And there's heaps of like really kind of funny ones and really kind of interesting ones within there. I highly suggest you recommend or su suggest you um, investigate. But the kind of last one I want to get into really um, is that we discard specifics to form kind of generalities. And the first one is negativity, and this one ties back in with a lot of the previous ones. Is that we we really really remember negative thoughts or negative experiences way way more than positive ones. If you've ever done a talk and gotten bad feedback, you'll know this. Um, you remember the, the negative ones far more than you do the positive. Um, and in software development, where I've kind of seen this is where um, people tend to like remember bad things about technology a lot. Like someone used something five years back and it was shit, so I'm never going to use it again. That's crazy. I don't know, like the things have moved on since then. It might have gotten better. Give it another try. Um, and unfortunately, I've even seen this with like people, where someone's had a bad experience with a person years and years ago, and they've completely written them off. Um, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. Um, yeah. um, you know, those people aren't either. Things might have changed for them too. Um, and ultimately on this one, I think it's awareness of negativity and awareness that it affects us all so much is important and something that I'd highly or I'd ask you to kind of um, invest in. The last one I want to chuck onto, um, and this is my can of worms, but I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, if I did a talk about bias and didn't talk about prejudice. Um, which is one of the, the main biases, or major biases that we see affecting people today. And prejudice is an unfavorable feeling towards a person or thing prior to or not based on actual experience that you've had with it. Um, and this area is well studied. There's, there's kind of two factors to it. One is what's called an in-group favoritism, where you have a, a, a bias towards favoring things that are, that you, that are like you. Um, the other side is what's called an out-group negativity, where you have a, a negative kind of bias towards people who aren't in that group whatever you define your group as. One of the main kind of fallacies that I see around this is where um, I've often talked talk to male, male, men, developers, male developers, um, and they've said to me about, you know, there's more women coming into the industry, and they're like, yeah, I'm okay with more women as long as it doesn't lower the bar. And yeah, that's what I say. Um, and that's, like, that in itself shows the thinking of it. Like they've already thought as this, and this out group, as women, you know, because they're that much different to us, um, are somehow, you know, not quite there in terms of average skill. And I've heard the same thing from when people are talking about, particularly here in Australia, kind of South Asians. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with people, well, I don't work for them anymore, but people who said, I just won't hire Indians. That's crazy, you know, but you actually hear these attitudes from, from developers too, as well. 
And what I say to them is, and it kind of counts the same for women too, but like there's five million developers in India. It, even if you, you know, even if you were to kind of say, yeah, they're, you know, they're on average, they're not as good. You know, that just kind of puts the peak more in the middle. The long tail of that 5.4 million who are exceptional or really good developers are more developers than we have in Australia, you know? And the same applies for women. There's 51% of them, you know? Even if you take that kind of average thing, that long tail, means you're gonna get good people in there too. And just a few things to note. So men tend to have what's called like an ethnic favoritism. Sorry, I'm really short time. Um, more than women. And sorry, women tend to have a, a stronger kind of bias towards own, their own gender. So I think Donna Edwards spoke about it earlier on that it's hard to kind of hire women sometimes when there aren't women already there. Um, and that is a real problem, but there's, it's, a, it's a real effect that's kind of in there. Um, you should talk to Donna if you do need to kind of hire more women. But um, I hope from kind of what I've shown you today and what we've talked about that you can see that diversity goes a long way towards debiasing some of those things that we've seen. And that I really, really think, you know, it's uh, like a diversity of not only gender or kind of ethnicity or sex or background or even diversity of thought. It's something that we all need and that we all need to kind of get better. So I'm a minute over time, I apologize. That ends our spin around the codex. Uh, I hope I've given you some insight. I hope I've inspired some, uh, inspired you to investigate a little bit more. You can Google the Cognitive Bias Codex. There's SVG links that you can click into from each one of those and explore around. Um, some, some really, really good ones in there. Um, but I will caution you, like any knowledge that you take, please, please be careful with it. Um, do some investigation to, before you go off and accuse your boss of illusory superiority, you know? Um, to speak over it. But if you do investigate or have stories, I would love to hear them. Um, I'd love to hear what you discover. Um, I do have stickers down here, but, um, and if you want to come up and talk to me after, feel free, or I'll see you on the boat. Thank you all.